Thanks, Pippa. Uh, good morning. Um, good morning, everyone. Nice to see uh, a lot of familiar faces and uh, some new ones as well. So I think everybody at least uh, knows the buzzword about green buildings, uh, the need for, for greater building energy efficiency, to use the sort of buzzword about it. But in fact, I think something much more profound, even revolutionary, is going on in this sector. And so I'm uh, I want to focus on China because, as with so many other areas in, in global economy, this is where the real action is. We all know impo how important the property sector is, but uh, I think we, we often think it's one that doesn't change too much. It's for good reason. It's very conservative. It's often slow moving. There's obviously a lot of money, a lot of capital investment involved. But in fact, there are, again, revolutionary changes at work here, and there's a huge amount of money being spent on, on the green part. So this is uh, the question I get when people look at this ahead of time is you're missing a slide. No, um, that's actually from the 50th floor of the uh, China World, um, the Shangri-La Hotel up in Beijing. You can sort of dimly see some buildings there. This was um, uh, taken a year ago last March, uh, as I said, from the Shangri-La Hotel on a not very nice day in Beijing. And uh, you, you wonder, what's the connection between air pollution in Beijing and, and green buildings? And it's because, uh, we, although we're often thinking of cars and trucks and buses and steel mills as causing air pollution, it's really buildings that are responsible for most of the biggest single source of, of energy use in the world. And most of those buildings are powered by coal-fired power plants, especially in China, where about 70% of the electricity is produced by coal-fired power plants. Those coal-fired power plants um, throw up all these nice little particulates, which uh, uh, make for this wonderful um, hazy Beijing picture. And it's a, a picture that the Chinese government has increasingly told people um, it's going to do something about. And the government in China has, above all, a social contract with, with people to, to govern, govern well, govern effectively. And they've done a terrific job, as we all know, with economic growth, 8% economic growth uh, over the la each year over the last 30 years. But this is the cost. And I think the government is promising people that this is a price that their kids aren't going to have to pay forever, that they're going to clean things up. So this is, this is the big overall picture. Buildings are the energy hogs. They're the gas guzzlers. They're like Cadillacs in the 1950s. They just, they're just consuming too much energy. And for domestic reasons, China needs to focus on that. But there's an international context, too. And I think this is very important to understand and to understand how serious uh, China is about the building sector. This is, of course, Xi Jinping. Uh, he's in Hangzhou at the G20, and he's just signed the Paris Climate Agreement. And most of you will know that agreement was, uh, was um, agreed on last December, exactly a year ago, in Paris, when 195 countries plus the European Union, uh, for the first time internationally, got together and said, we're going to do something. We're going to each have our own national programs, but collectively, we're going to agree on what we're going to do and the idea is to keep uh, greenhouse gas emissions from increasing to an extent that we can keep the rise in global warming to two degrees Celsius. It's probably not going to quite be that good. It's going to be a little worse than that. But the important point is that China signed on to that. China has never si signed on to a multilateral agreement. Well, there's never been one. But China has never, in a multilateral framework, made the sort of promises that Xi Jinping made and signed and ratified in Hangzhou. And that commits China to peaking its carbon emissions by around 2030. And to do that, it has to focus on the building sector. And there's this, this grand symbolism, the theater, Hangzhou, the UN flag, the Chinese flag. You've got the American flag because Barack Obama has just had signed and ratified for the US at the same time. Now, it's sort of fitting that Obama is sort of sitting down and in the background in this picture because, as we all know, next month he's going to be uh, unemployed. And I think some of you have heard we have a new US president coming in who um, doesn't exactly have the same uh, approach to, to climate change that, that Obama does. Trump says that he'll pull out of the Paris Agreement. We don't know if that's true. And if it's true, how long it's going to take and what form it's going to take. I would argue that it's, in a way, irrelevant. Because the big picture, the big player in the room is China. And China is going to keep ahead with its Paris commitments for a couple of reasons. First of all, 
uh, it's, it's got this domestic agenda. And air pollution and, and greenhouse gases are not the same thing, but they're very closely correlated. And you cut, you cut, cut air pollution, you cut greenhouse gases, you cut carbon, it, it all works together. So China's got this domestic promise that it's making to its people, and it's going to clean up air pollution. But hey, for Xi Jinping, chance to uh, advance the ag domestic agenda, do what he's going to do domestically anyway, and show up as a statesman on the international stage. So here's China at a time when, you know, there are a lot of questions about the Chinese economic model. There, there's criticism about China's actions in the South China Sea and other places. Here's a chance for Xi Jinping, the strongest leader we've seen in, in at least since Deng Xiaoping and maybe since Mao in China, who's um, a statesman on the international stage. He's China's being doing the right thing. And especially at a time when the U.S. is backing off, China is not backing off. And China has made this explicit. The uh, chief climate negotiator, Xi Jinhua, came out after Trump made his remarks about pulling out and said, we're in there. This is, we've signed on, we're doing this. So don't think that China is going to try to shirk its responsibilities. As a matter of fact, I would argue that um, as good as the Chinese promises are to peak by 2030, that in fact they'll do better than that. And they're, they're likely to peak their carbon emissions five years or even more ahead of time. And by the way, it's not just that they're signing the Paris Agreement and then they're going to start the work. The current five-year plan is already calling for radical retrofits of, of uh, millions of square meters of space and spending that uh, I've seen estimates of around 250 billion US dollars. That's US dollars, not renminbi, on building energy efficiency. There's real work being done underneath the hood. There's real work being done on the ground. And uh, the picture you see from Hangzhou is just, um, you know, it's not for show, but I mean, it's, it's hiding how much real work is being done underneath. That red line are, are Chinese greenhouse gas emissions. Over on the left is 1990. You see China's pretty low. Uh, the US is the blue line. Uh, the line underneath that is the EU, then China, then India. And in the middle of the chart, you see there's this dramatic acceleration. And that's around the turn of the century. That's when China entered the WTO. And that's when China, China's economy went into overdrive, uh, you know, percentage-wise, still increasing, well, increasing more than 8% a year. But particularly, I mean, literally fired up the coal boilers. And the heavy industry and the, the building boom really took off. So part of that's WTO-related and export-related. And part of it is just the strength of the domestic economy and the importance of the building sector. So you see this dramatic acceleration in that red line to the point where China's greenhouse gas emissions are close to 30% of the global total. Uh, so the, all of us, the entire world, has a real stake in seeing that China gets it right. The good news is um, that China's, it's the, the rate of increase has slowed down dramatically. It hasn't quite flattened out, but it's close to flattening out. And as I said, uh, the, the Chinese plans are for the peak to come around 2030. I think, it's, I think we're a lot closer to it than that. The other good news, the, the EU and the US are, are pretty flat. Um, we can talk more about India in the Q&A if we like, but um, India is obviously a, a worry in terms of its, its real growth. So in cities, buildings use more electricity. China is becoming more urbanized. So China is going to be using, uh, or Chinese buildings are going to be using more electricity. Right now in China, buildings are only responsible for about a quarter of final energy demand compared to a third or a half in, in the rest of the world. So uh, unfortunately, there, there are big challenges for China ahead as it continues to urbanize, as we continue to see 15 or 20 million people moving into urban areas every year. So that by 2030, we're going to have a billion Chinese living in cities. They're going to be in buildings. They're going to be in buildings that are using a lot more electricity than uh, what their, their traditional, um, whether they're out in the countryside or they're, they're in a, a kind of less developed urban or semi-urban area. And so, the numbers just don't stack up. And there was an American economist, Herbert Stein, who said, what can't go on forever has to stop. And I would submit that the Chinese leadership have decided that buildings as energy guzzling hogs has to stop as a policy. They, they can't meet the promise they've made to their own people to clean up pollution. They can't meet the promises they've made to the international world if things don't change. So what's a green building? Um, to remind all of you, it's a, it can be a very broad kind of definition. But basically, it's looking at the entire life cycle of a building from, from the original design, the architecture, even the siting of the building, through, of course, the, the construction of it, the use of uh, materials, hopefully using fewer materials, 
Um, and of course, through the operations and maintenance, through making sure you have good energy efficient lighting and, and cooling, all the way through to the demolition of the building. So it's really looking at the life cycle of the building. And the savings that we can get in terms of, of overall energy and of electricity in particular are, are quite profound. So we're generally looking at, at a quarter to a half uh, in terms of total energy use compared to sort of a reference building, a business as usual building versus a, a green building. Looking at a, a cut of uh, carbon emissions of a third to 40 percent. Um, water use is another important issue, uh, particularly in water stressed countries like China and India. We're looking at typically a 40 percent cut in, in water. Um, and then solid waste, that can be reduced by as much as 70 percent through, um, through better uh, use of materials, fewer materials, better materials, uh, through recycling. Many of you will know that the biggest single uh, source of waste in cities, including in Hong Kong, for, for our landfills is from buildings that are being torn down. So we need to build buildings to, to last longer. In China, buildings only last about half as long as they do in the rest of the world. So you use a lot of cement and glass and steel to build the buildings, and then you tear them down twice as fast as, as you would anywhere else. So Singapore has one of the most far-reaching green buildings programs in the world. Um, some of you will know that uh, by 2030, the government has a target of 80 percent, 80 percent of the building stock to be green. And of course, Singapore is a small place. I mean, the population is less than Hong Kong. You have a very, very strong, capable government. But you have far-reaching policies that start from the prime minister and go all the way down and go down to the level not only of the government, but of course to individual buildings. So if you want to retrofit a building in Singapore, you have to do it to increasingly stringent, environmentally stringent codes. Same thing for a new building. So 80% green by, by 2030 is, if not the most aggressive target in the world, certainly the most far-reaching in Asia. But I want to talk a little bit about the, the, the country on the far right, which is India. 37% of green build of buildings last year started in India were, were considered green. And I, I, this, this surprised me when I, when I first saw uh, the charts because we think, hey, green buildings are something that costs more money. I mean, how can, a, how can a poor country like India afford to be doing more green than, than China or, or the US? And that's because it's actually a myth to think that green buildings cost more. They cost a little bit more upfront, usually from 1% to 4%. Um, can be more, depends. Uh, in the early stages of, of this revolution, they tended to cost more. But they, the savings are so profound, and in countries like India, which have expensive electricity, expensive water, and uncertain access to electricity and water, having a green building, a building that uses these resources, uses inputs like electricity and water more efficiently, pays off. It pays off in terms of better security. It pays off in terms of having fewer backup units. I mean, major office buildings in, in Bombay, I mean, it's the, the financial capital of India, and yet they're all, they all have these big backup uh, generators. If you can run a building that needs less electricity, less juice, you don't need as much backup generating capacity. So you end up saving a lot of money. And I think it, the Indian example is, is a very interesting illustration of how it's not that countries can't afford to build green buildings. In some cases, they can't afford not to build green buildings. And I think that's, for a variety of reasons, that's what's happening in China. So let's go closer to Asia. Another iconic building, I think a lot of you know this, is the uh, Shanghai Tower. I believe it's the second largest, the tallest building in Asia after Burj Al Khalifa, although that, I would argue, is in, in Dubai is a bit of a showcase. This is a real working building, and uh, uh, it's, yeah, it's a real feat of engineering. I, I love the fact that their elevators go 70 kilometers an hour, Hitachi elevators, faster than the traffic in, uh, in Shanghai. But if you're, if you're building something this, this size and this scale, I mean, you, you need the best technology. And there, there's so many things we could spend an entire hour just talking about this building. But one of the things that really struck me is they used advanced modeling, um, computer modeling, to reduce the wind load by about 20 percent. And that allowed them to reduce the structural steel by 20 percent. So that's saving on materials. It's saving on costs. And it's, uh, of course, ultimately leading to less uh, energy use. They have the outside, what you see, there's a, there's a second skin that's wrapping around a lot of that. And in between the skin of the, the main building and the outer skin are a lot of atriums, open spaces, light. But it's also acting as an insulation, as a buffer between, um, between the skin of the building and, and outside. Uh, there are dozens and dozens of technologies here, but the, 
the overall effect is that they expect this will cut energies by 21% you, you, over a comparable building. And so you look at a building of this scale and this size, and you think of a 21% energy reduction, it's, it's phenomenal, particularly when you think of the energy needed to move people up and down those, those 70 kilometer an hour elevators. So it's an example, I think, in a very high-end, high-tech way of what can be done. Many of you know Hung, Hung Lung Properties, which of course uh, has its uh, headquarters in Hong Kong. And, Coincidentally, Ronnie Chan, who's the chairman, was the founding chairman of the Asia Business Council, is somebody I've talked to a lot about green buildings over the nine years that I've been at the council and have been engaged with these issues. And I'd say at that time, when I first started talking to Ronnie, he was a bit lukewarm, lukewarm about green buildings. He thought they are probably a good thing, it was the right thing to do. Um, yeah, I'd get a payback, but it's not as good a payback as you get just from, from building and selling property, which is, um, can often be very lucrative. Um, but he wanted to stay ahead of the Chinese government. He was smart. He realized nine years ago that there was going to be a lot more focus on the part of the government in, uh, in terms of um, energy use. And he said, yeah, they're, they're looking at steel mills and cement factories now, but they're going to have their sights set on buildings because buildings are the, are the, real, uh, the real issue here. And so uh, under Ronnie's leadership, uh, they set uh, some fairly aggressive targets, a 10% cut in energy intensity, so using 10% less, actually electricity, 10% less electricity per square meter. And the, this was set in 2010. The idea was by 2015, if they were using 100 kilowatts an hour, they'd be using 90 kilowatts hour for 90 kilowatt hours for any given space. Lo and behold, 2015 came and went. They added up the numbers. They found out they were 18% improvement over those five years. Wow, you know, almost, almost twice of what they expected. So what did they do? They went back and they effectively doubled down. They said from 2016 to 2020, we're going to cut it another 12%. So um, that's compounded. That comes out to almost a 30% reduction in energy intensity. And um, I mean, <laughs> these are not small projects, as you can see. I mean, they're building major CBD, sort of Pacific Place, Rockefeller Center-style complexes. And they have them in eight mainland cities now. Um, all being built to uh, pretty high standards. I think many of you know the U.S. Green Building Council has uh, standards that um, are sort of the basic silver, gold, platinum, and they're building it to gold or above. So, um, and again, it's not rocket science. It's setting a process in motion. It's setting some targets. It's starting to measure, and then it's drilling down and just doing the hard day-in, day-out stuff of running, running your business, but running it with more energy efficiency. This is, um, uh, will be the highest passive house in the world, or one of the, sorry, one of the highest passive uh, buildings in the world. What's a passive building? A passive building is like uh, green buildings on the steroids. If green buildings would save typically a quarter to a half of energy, passive house can save 75% to, in this case, projected to save 90% of energy compared to a traditional building. And it's doing this through um, uh, very advanced materials in terms of ins insulation, the slab, the envelope, you know, the glass, everything that's cladding the building. And you end up with much, much better air quality because you're controlling the building. The building is actually so separated from the outside environment. Interestingly, I think this, this passive house concept could, or passive building, um, we call them passive houses because they used to be much smaller. Uh, but this concept could potentially take off much more quickly in China because there's such a concern among Chinese people with air quality. And I think any of us who spend time in Beijing know, well, how bad it is, but we, we spend time in the mainland, how much our Chinese friends are concerned about the air that they're breathing. Because that day that I showed you in Beijing at the beginning, that's like a forest fire. The air quality index was, was well over 300, which in the US, by US standards, would be more or less what you see in a forest fire. People don't want to be working in a forest fire. They don't want their kids out in a forest fire. You, know, you see these AQI, these air quality index uh, signs and alerts outside schools. Basically, everything's canceled. People are living under a dome. You know, you, many of you will know that video uh, about life in the, in the polluted world of the mainland, but the passive houses have such clean air that I think there's potentially huge market demand for this in China because the, the need for it is so great. There's a, a, a real demand among workers in China, it seems, to, to be working in, in cleaner and safer and healthier workplaces. So par paradoxically, the situation in China is so bad right now that there's a potential that China could leapfrog in buildings just as it's leapfrogged in some other technologies. So, um, 
uh, maybe we'll have Ann Jacobs from BAS talk, uh, talk a little bit more during the Q&A session about, about this, and maybe I'm too optimistic, but because um, uh, I know it's really hard from talking to Ann to actually do this, but theoretically, I think there's a market demand that, um, that could see it take off much faster in China. So I want to just finish up with a couple of slides that are sort of beyond the, the, um, the examples. Uh, there's this issue of consumers and of employees, I said. So I think companies that are, that are doing good things also have a competitive advantage. They don't just save money, but they're also able to connect with consumers in a different sort of way. So this is an example from Singapore. It's a building called 313 at Somerset. It's owned by uh, the Australian real estate uh, company Lend Lease, which gets uh, extremely good marks in terms of its um, environmental standards. It's, the building is run to a very high environmental standard, but what's interesting is they're also they're marketing it to millennials. You see young, potentially, uh, well, young woman, potential shopper, I guess, holding a green globe, uh, go green with 313. Uh, the, the text, it's just a scrape, of course, from, a, from their website. The text is talking about Earth Day and their involvement with the environment. Drill down, of course, and, and there, there's a huge amount of technology in this building. It's, it's, it's a very green building. You can go down on the website and find all the details about their escalators and their lighting and their car park and the building shell and everything. But the pitch, and the pitch to consumers is Green Globe, Earth Day, you're doing your bit for the environment by shopping here. And I think that, again, this the green can be a competitive advantage in terms of marketing. And it increasingly will be one that's necessary and that, that millennials in particular expect. I mentioned Chinese employees before. I saw a recent survey that 56% of Chinese employees said that a, the workplace environment, that a healthy workplace environment was a reason to switch jobs. Now, I'm somewhat suspicious of some of these studies and you know who knows how the questions were answered, but it, it rings true that uh, as urban Chinese, and we've got roughly 600 million urban Chinese, um, but let's say there are 250 or 400 million that are, let's just say, broadly speaking, middle class, right? They have options, they have choices, they have affluence that their parents, let alone their grandparents, wouldn't have had. And they can think about things like, hey, I could be in a workplace, and most of them are, many of them are knowledge workers, white collar workers. They can think, I can be in a sick building, or I can be in a green building. Which are they going to choose? Of course they're going to choose the green building. Just as in the West, 20 years ago, people used to be in sick buildings. They said, we don't want to be in sick buildings. And green buildings tend to be healthier buildings. They feel nicer. Productivity, again, I'm a bit suspicious of some of these studies from the green building industry, but productivity tends to be higher. Workers tend to be more engaged. They tend to be happier. And I think you know we're into a different world where people have choices. And, uh, Employees have choices, shoppers have choices, and green buildings and the ability to differentiate oneself both on the marketing side but really on the actual physical side in terms of how a building feels to live in, to work in. It's going to be a competitive advantage. And um, the, the developers that don't keep up with that risk the, 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 uh, having essentially stranded assets, really un underperforming assets. And so. You can get with the program, or you can risk getting steamrolled. Or steamrollered. And I think that uh, companies that are not embracing these real changes and these, these opportunities that make business sense risk being um, severely damaged. The, the real changes have really just started. And I think that we won't even really be talking that much about green buildings in the next 10 years. I hope not. Um, this is what my Singaporean friends tell me. They say, we don't, we don't talk about it. It's just that we just, build, we just build efficiency into our designs. And we've lived in a, in a world of incredible plenty and abundance in the post-1945 period. There are a lot of things that are changing now. Geopolitics are changing, but the, the limits to growth and the, the amount of resources that the 7.5 billion of us going to 10 billion on the planet by mid-century uh, use is just going to have to be rethought. And this is the place to start. Um, I hope I've convinced you there's a revolution that's starting. You're in the early days, and I hope you're on the right side of it. So thank you very much. Appreciate it.